So tonight we're going to uh, have our uh, some announcements, our main feature, a break, a lot more announcements. Sorry guys, I've got a whole bunch to tell you before the summer comes. Uh, we may not have um, time for a brick wall bomb because I'm hoping to get everybody who attended conference 2016 to come up and tell us about their favorite lecture. So be warned and be thinking about your favorite lecture if you were at conference 2016. <laughs> so welcome everybody. Our meetings are open to the public. Is there any first time attendees here? Oh wow, very good. Now, not to put you on the spot, but I'm going to ask you to stand. Tell us your name and the surnames you are searching because you never know when you make a connection here with other people in the branch. So, we we'll start at the back. David Hubbard, and family names are Hubbard, Joyner, and Keegan. Hubbard, Joyner, Joyner and Keegan? Keegan is from Dublin, Ireland. Okay. Hubbard's and the Joyner, otherwise from England, uh, Western. Okay, thank you. Uh, George Tompkins, uh, former member of the OGS. We joined the OGS yesterday and mm -hmm. the Durham group. Uh, family names are Tompkins, Holroyd, and Rogers, primarily through Romanville, Manasillan, uh, Horton, and Hanson. So Thompson's Tompkins, Tompkins Holloway, Holroyd, Holroy, and, and Rogers. Rogers. I got one out of three. That's about my average. Okay. I'm Stan Norrish. I live near Hampton. And uh, surnames I'm looking for is Haight. And there's a senior and it's earlier. H A I G H T. He's looking for Haight. H A I G H T. And Thomas. And Thomas. Okay. Thank you. Have I missed anybody? Yes, I have. Okay, Briar, B R Y E R, and Svar? Svar, C V A R. C V A R, sounds Middle European. Yeah, Yugoslavian. Yugoslavian. Okay. Yes. Hi, I'm Estelle Eagleson, and I came to hear what this gentleman had to say because I think a lot, a lot of our family are buried in. In Grove side or not yes. Grove side? Yes. Hi, Grove. Mother was a Milner. Okay, at the break, if you could, we have a sheet of paper at the back. If you could put your name and the names you're researching and your contact information, if we ever get the same names again, we'll let you know. Now, the beginning of May, uh, Deborah Wilbur and I manned a table at the Oshawa Public Library's event called how to in 10, which really means how to do almost anything in 10 minutes. Well, as you know, genealogy takes one or two minutes longer than that, but we did our best, and our table was well received, so I just felt we had to brag. And keep in mind that uh, October 29th, we are doing a one-day workshop it's going to be at Faith United Church. We have set the price, $35, which will include lunch. And our featured speaker is Ruth Blair. And I'm still working on the Scottish speaker. He hasn't quite said yes yet. And we are going to try and have a, a, a marketplace so that if you know of any historical societies or archives that you want us to invite, Please let me know. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Okay. Well, I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight with his tales from Pine Grove Cemetery. Paul Arculus was born in Sheffield, England, but emigrated to Canada as a teenager. 
He received a BA in psychology from McMaster, a BEd from the University of Toronto, an MA in history, and an MSc in education from Niagara University in New York. He spent 20 years teaching history at Port Ferry High School. How did you ever survive? <laughs> Those were the good old days. <laughs> Since retirement, Paul has devoted his time to researching and writing about Ontario history and has written a number of books and articles on the subject, which I will not list because it will delay it too long. Suffice it to say, he has many about Port Perry, Skewgog, and even some about Uxbridge, so that's my area. Paul conducts historical walking tours and cemetery tours in Port Perry and surrounding areas. In 2008, he received the Lieutenant, sorry, Lieutenant, I shouldn't be American here, Lieutenant Governor's mm -hmm. Ontario Heritage Award for his work. And in 2013, he received the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. I believe he's still currently president of the Lake Skugog Historical Society. I looked at their website to be sure. And of course, he's brought his latest book with him and he's going to be entertaining us with tales from Pine Grove Cemetery. I go cemetery book, ten bucks. <laughs> uh, the, I released it at the same time. This is a history of the St. John's Anglican Church in Blackstock, which is also a history of Cartwright Township. Ten bucks. And I brought copies of the book I talked about when I last spoke here, three years ago. Yeah, which is Durant's Right Hand Man. And uh, there's a reason for that, which I'll get to. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. And um, uh, first of all, a thank you specifically to this genealogical society, because if it wasn't for them, I don't think I'd be doing one tenth of what I'm able to do. Because what you people did back in 1988 was to go through all the cemeteries of what is now Skugog Township and list every single gravestone and all the inscriptions on all the gravestones that were there. Now, from this group, and I'm going to read them out. I realize some are no longer with us, but anyway, let's read them out. Good old Bessie Gannon. Yeah, yeah Bessie. Um, Eleanor Bland. T. Dunstan. Who's that T. Dunstan? Terry. Okay. Joyce and Ed Fitzgerald. Carol Gamble, D. Howe, Marion Lapp, Pauline Marshall, D. Marshall, K. Picard, oh yes, good old K. G. Offerson, Midge Rafton, Janice Richardson, Gwen Toes, and Steve Wood. Now they are the people who did the Pine Grove Cemetery that I'm going to be talking about today. They went through that cemetery, and that is an onerous task. Now, any of those people here today? Just one of you. Steve will be along later. Steve will be later, okay. All right, well, anyway, you, you know, I, I have an immense debt of gratitude to pay to you for that work that was done, because in all of my books that I've written that have anything to do with, uh, with Skugog Township, or even uh, one of my earlier books, which was on the Markham Gang that we spoke about years ago, um, which was re reached out right across the province and beyond, um, the groundwork that you did, particularly in that cemetery, had to do with the Crandalls and some of the people who were involved in the Markham Gang. Now, I'm not going to repeat the speech that I gave to you about seven or eight years ago on the Markham Gang, but they were a bunch of uh, thugs and hoodlums who wandered Ontario in the 1840s. They were a mafia of the 1840s, and they emanated from Pickering and Reach Townships. There was a couple from Oxbridge, too. <laughs> not to be left out, not to be left out. Um, I want to, uh, and there's a reason for this, I want to briefly uh, summarize part of what I talked about when I spoke to you three years ago. Uh, and what I spoke about then was the book that I had there, which is uh, Durant's Right Hand Man. Because this kind of leads me into the discussion uh, of Pine, Pine Grove Cemetery. Um, I spoke about 
uh, Edwin Campbell. And I had never heard about him ever, ever, ever until I discovered him because somebody had made a record of him because his name was on a monument in the Pine Grove Cemetery. And Edwin Campbell uh, became a doctor, uh, but let's back up here before he became a doctor. He was a friend of Sam McLaughlin, a childhood friend of Sam McLaughlin. Uh, he was a school chum of H. A. Bruce, who became Dr. H. A. Bruce, who founded Wellesley Hospital in Toronto and went on to become the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario in 32 to 37. Uh, he was also a good friend of uh, Whitbyite, uh, Lois Barker, uh, who became a British MP. Uh, sorry, no, Lois Barker was the guy who went to Johns Hopkins in the States and became one of their leading physicians. And he was a Whitby boy. And um, uh, he and H.A. Bruce, in their spare time, both worked in drugstores. H.A. Bruce in Port Perry and Llewellyn Barker in, in Whitby. And this was the very early days of telephones, and they used to talk to each other over the telephone. Llewellyn Barker's father was a Baptist minister and used to come up to Port Perry to preach on Sundays and bring his son Llewellyn uh, up there, and that's how they met. And the other person, of course, was Hamer Greenwood. Now, Anybody here know who Hamar Greenwood was? No, okay. Hamar Greenwood, uh, his father was a lawyer, also called Hamar Greenwood, and that's where it gets confusing for genealogists. Um, Hamar Greenwood was a lawyer here in, in Whitby, and his son, also named Hamar, used to travel with him, and Hamar Greenwood Sr. used to go to Port Perry and adjudicate, and he, he, invariably his son went with him. So, H.A. Bruce, uh, um, Edwin Campbell, Loellis Barker, Hamer Greenwood, all, and Sam McLaughlin, all buddies in their teenage years. Well, I'd actually be starting in their, in their pre-teens as well. Now, isn't that a power group? Isn't that a power group? And Barker, of course, became the head of uh, infectious diseases at um, at um, Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. And that was particularly important during the, uh, the outbreak of influenza in 1918, which killed millions of people. More people died in the uh, 1918 influenza epidemic than died in the war. Horrible. And we'll make reference to that a little bit then as we're talking about the Pine Grove Cemetery. Well, the reason I wanted to touch on those is because they were all friends, and there are several connections with, with, with the Pine Grove Cemetery. Not only uh, Edwin Campbell, uh, but the Bruce family. They're all buried in the Pine Grove Cemetery. And another man who became a, a later friend, he, they, um, Bruce and Campbell <clears throat> went to Port Perry High School. <laughs> graduated from Port, Port Perry High School, and another graduate was a fellow by the name of McBrien, James Howden McBrien, and he was born in, in Prince Albert, the south, south end of Port Perry, and uh, his father was a uh, public school inspector and traveled all over uh, the old Ontario County, uh, inspecting schools and so on, and um, anyway, uh, James Howden McBrien graduated from Port Perry High School about 1888, about uh, three or four years after, uh, after Bruce and Campbell graduated. Anyway, McBrien went on to become uh, a very close friend of Dr. Bruce and Edwin Campbell, and um, he later joined the, uh, the expeditionary forces, and at the end of World War I became the head of the, uh, the Canadian Army, the end of World War I. Uh, he was involved with the mechanization of the Canadian Army at the end of World War I, and then he became head of the RCMP. And what he did for the RCMP as head of the RCMP, he traveled around, visited, in a matter of two years, visited every single detachment of the RCMP. And to do that, you know what he did? He learned to fly, so that he could fly anywhere he wanted to go. And uh, anyway, um, his son became the chauffeur for Dr. H.A. Bruce when Bruce was the, uh, was the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. 
So this is a, a vicious circle of, of, of great people who are tied in directly with, uh, with the Pine Grove Cemetery. Now, the Pine Grove Cemetery, as I, as I uh, kind of hinted at, is an incredible cemetery that I don't think most people realize how important it is. Those who, are doing the, who did the survey now know. Uh, today it's a 13-acre cemetery, one of the largest in this part of the province. Has over 8,000, the remains of 8,000 people in it. But the outreach of those people is incredible. In that cemetery, there's an NHL all-star. There's a Hollywood movie star. There's the guy who founded CTV. There's the family of uh, the uh, guy who later founded CKY and owned the Washington Redskins and the um, Los Angeles uh, Lakers basketball team. All of these people, and Dr. Bruce, his family is all in Pine Grove Cemetery. And, of course, that's how I discovered Campbell. I, every, every year I give a cemetery walk in, in Prince Albert, and I will be doing, by the way, and I'll plug it again at the end on uh, July the 3rd this year, Sunday, 2 o'clock. Come along, no charge, just smile, you're free. Um, <laughs> And in that walk, I owe each year, I try to add a few new people to my uh, kind of inventory of people to talk about. And I did, knew nothing about Edwin Campbell, and, but I had seen this fairly impressive monument up in the northeast corner of the cemetery. And at the bottom of it was this inscription, uh, Edwin, uh, Edwin R. Campbell, MD, doctor, uh, and, and the year years of his birth and death, 18, 1929, when he died. And I always thought, well, that's very interesting. And I thought, well, let me find out something about him. Well, I found out, and here's where genealogists have all kinds of trouble, he wasn't buried there. He paid for the monument. <laughs> so he had his name put on the bottom. <laughs> because it's his parents' monument. His parents and his mother, uh, his, his sister, uh, and there's reference also to another brother who isn't buried there either. He's buried in New York. And Edwin Campbell, when I was doing the research for the book, my wife and I went down to New York and we found Edwin Campbell. He's buried in that magnificent cemetery. If you ever go there, you've got to go to Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. How many of you have been to the Woodlawn Cemetery? It's an absolutely epic place to go. The Woolworths are there, and the Chryslers are there, and the monuments make your house look like a garage. <laughs> the monuments are absolutely incredible. They're huge. I don't know how much these monuments cost, some of them, but they're, you know, the mausoleums and Cairns and Willie Durant, founder of General Motors, he's buried there. Of course, that's worked into the title of the book. It, they're just amazing. And I went there and um, uh, I had found out by going through all the obituaries, I, uh, looking for obituaries in, in the various newspapers, there was no coverage of his obituary in the Port Perry papers for some strange reason. But there was in Toronto and then in Detroit, it was a full page. And the New York Times, full page, front page, the death of Edwin Campbell. Uh, and the reason was not his, his, uh, his importance as a founder of General Motors, which he was, because he married Durant's daughter. Um, but the importance was that he was tremendously wealthy. He was wealthier, comparatively speaking, wealthier than that ugly, stupid man who's running for president of the United States. <laughs> uh, he would be classified today as a, as a multi-billionaire. And he'd made all his money in in his involvement with the creation of General Motors and uh, with land speculation in California with standard, what later became Standard Oil and so on. An amazing man. Well, his family are all in the Pine Grove, Pine Grove Cemetery. Now, I repeat again, I'm giving a, a walk uh, at Pine Grove on July the 3rd. Okay, July the 3rd, you got that? July the 3rd. Two o'clock in the afternoon, it's a Sunday. And rain or shine, bring your umbrellas if it's raining. 
Um, and we will make a quick reference to, uh, to, to Campbell. We don't have much time because there's so much other stuff to cover. I'm going to take you through some of the uh, other more interesting things in the, uh, in the Pine Grove Cemetery. Oh, but before we get too far on it and, and to the Pine Grove Cemetery, I've got to read you this obituary. Now, this appeared in, uh, in 1868. And it was in the Port Perry, um, uh, sorry, the North Ontario Observer, which was a newspaper initially published in Prince Albert. And then when the train came in 1871, it moved to uh, Port Perry and became the mouthpiece of the whole of the northern part of the old Ontario County, hence the name North Ontario Observer. Now, you think you have skill at writing? Anybody here? Listen to this. This is the way to write an obituary. The chill, icy hand of death has again been stretched out with fatal certainty and nipped another flower in full bloom. Even terror's king likes to have his preferences. Some seasons he steals along our streets in the silent watches of the night. Clad in his sober sadness, he visits the nursery and the cradle, selecting only the feeble infant and the lisping child. At other times, doffing his black garments, he makes his ravages at noonday. He walks the busy haunts of life and with relentless unpitying stroke prostrates the young, the healthful, and the vigorous, regardless of the sobs and cries and tears of sorrowing relatives and mourning friends. And certainly this has been his course in our vicinity of late. He has added another name to the long list for it becomes our painful duty to record the sudden and unexpected decease of Mr. Samuel McConnell, his grave's there, second son of Mr. William McConnell, farmer of Reach Township, who was cut out in the ruby gush of health and the very meridian of life, in the bloom and vigor of manhood's brightest days, aged 29 years and four months. Exactly one month ago, this deceased accidentally stumbled over a chair, his right side coming heavily down upon the corner and back of it. He was pretty much hurt and felt it keenly at the time, but being a stout, healthy lad, he did not make much about it and strive to battle it. But the young man's die was cast. The inflammation of the lungs set in and carried him off in a few days. The deceased, being a member of the Prince Albert Light Infantry Company, was buried with military honors. A very large number of relatives and friends followed the corpse to the burial place. The funeral services were conducted by the Reverend G. Jameson, who improved the occasion by a very appropriate sermon from the 10th verse of the 9th chapter of Ecclesiastes. The afflicted parents and mourning relatives have our warmest and deepest sympathies. Now, isn't that the way to write an obituary? <laughs> isn't that incredible? But that happens so often, so frequently. Oh, but this was outstanding. That's the best one I've been able to find. Well, Bangrove Cemetery. Uh, as I say, it's, it's 13 acres in size. Um, the land was originally uh, under the ownership of a fellow by the name of Abner Hurd. Now, in the early days of Reach Township, which is now essentially Skewgog, the first settler we have there is Reuben Crandall, and we'll visit his, uh, his grave and memorial. Reuben Crandall settled uh, just west of Prince Albert in 1821. Um, and uh, in 1824, Abner Hurd came and settled in the essential core of Prince Albert. Now, you all know, you, you all know where Prince Albert is, the south end of Port Perry. Okay. If you go to the four corners of Prince Albert, there's a store on the corner. Okay. And if you go north, immediately north, there's an empty lot. And that is the first burial ground, which has nothing to do with Pine Grove. It was a, uh, an Indian burial ground, First Nation burial ground. And we had uh, our historical society got together with the Mississaugas and we paid for a, 
uh, a, a radar survey of the property and we found uh, evidence of at least 29 burials on that property. And they're all facing north. Each one is facing north. We'd love to be able to afford to have a proper archaeological dig on that property, but the cost would be horrendous uh, with all the legal problems involved in that. But that was the first cemetery anyway. And that was noted when uh, Wilmot did the survey of Reese Township in eight, oh, the winter of 1809-1810. And he made note of that particular burial ground. Now, if you go a little uh, bit north of that, you come to a little um, street called Barber Street, and then you go in, and the United Church is in there, and then the cemetery is in, the, in that area. Okay, and the bottom end of the cemetery, that was, well, that, actually, that whole corner, the whole of the northeast corner of Prince Albert, was uh, owned by Abner Hurd. And what he did, his wife, Anna, died in 1831, and he had her buried on that piece of property. And then he buried uh, his, one of his daughters there, and then other people in the community said, could we bury our relatives uh, and, and so on in this area? And it became informally the local cemetery. And it wasn't until till 1860 that the cemetery board was developed and they bought the land from Abner Hurd and that, be, that was how the cemetery was founded. But the first one then we have is that of Anna Hurd of 1831. Now, I've been able to locate reference to another member of the, of the Hurd family who died prior to that time, actually 1829, but uh, I don't know where he was buried. He could very well be on that property. We just don't know. Um, and then uh, let's move on now to another one, which is almost, if, if you go in from the south end of the cemetery, walk in the south end of the cemetery, uh, on the right hand side is where you'll find the oldest of the, of the graves. And that's where the herds are buried and also the, the sextons. And I have to tell you a little bit about the sexton. Little Sarah Sexton died in 1867. Eight years old she was. Sad. Do you know how she died? She died from eating the buds off a willow tree. She sat in the back garden of her uncle's place and sat there and gathered a whole bunch of these buds and they were so pretty that she ate them. Well, you eat enough of them and they become toxic and it killed her. Strange, strange death, strange death. Um, and then, uh, also in that area, is one of my heroes. Uh, his name was T.C. Foreman, Thomas Chalmers Foreman. And there's a lovely monument to him. Um, uh, let's see if I can find uh, all the information on, uh, on Thomas Chalmers. Oh, I should read you the obituary. And one of you girls wrote this obituary down that's on, that's on the sexton, uh, on the, on the uh, monument of the sexton. sexton. Grave. It says, her life is like the grass, our youth is like the flower, like us they bloom and flourish, then perish in an hour. Then a nice little poem. Well, that's them. Um, okay, T.C. Foreman was a fascinating fellow. Uh, fellow. Uh, he came from Scotland, emigrated from Scotland uh, uh, in the 1830s, and came initially to, uh, to Oshawa and started to work for Mr. Lang, who was the L-A-I-N-G, who was one of the uh, most important of the green merchants of, of Oshawa. And uh, Mr. Lang realized that Prince Albert was a going community, and so he said, hey, Thomas, up to Prince Albert. Let's get a business started up there. So we, Tom, Thomas Chalmers made his way to Prince Albert, settled there, and started up a granary, at least a, um, a grain buying business for Mr. Lang. And uh, then, just to kind of put the icing on the cake, he married uh, Lang's sister. So that, that helped the coffer, the family coffers. Um, but the thing that fascinated me about Thomas Chalmers Foreman was that he was involved in the, uh, in the Fenian Raids. The Fenian Raids of 1866, when uh, a group of uh, unruly Irishmen 
are there any Irishmen that aren't unruly? Uh, a group of unru unruly Irishmen made their way mainly from uh, New York State and Michigan State and decided they wanted to capture Canada. And they, uh, anyway, they, they raided uh, several parts of Canada, as you know, uh, Fort Erie and the Niagara Peninsula and up near Montreal. And of course, this was a real, a lot, of, a lot of these Fenians that came up, by the way, were just um, uh, unemployed men left over after the American Civil War. But, you know, I mean, that fizzled out. And so these guys who they had nothing to do, so they rallied around the Fenians because they were given a small stipend. And so they decided, right, let's rescue Canada from Britain. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Thomas Chalman Foreman was the captain of the militia in Prince Albert. And they had 50, count them, 50 members of the militia in Prince Albert. And he had done uh, quite well uh, in, in his merchant, uh, grain merchant business and built a huge drill shed, which is just a huge barn. And the Prince Albert militia got together every Wednesday and did their strutting around and they organized the town band and all the rest of it. It was huge. And then when the Fenians decided that they were going to take over Canada, um, uh, they the TC Foreman said, right, we're in on it. So uh, they decided they would join the rest of the, uh, the militia against the Fenians. And so Mr. Foreman got his troops together. And now remember, we're talking 1866 here. There's no transportation between Prince Albert and Oshawa or Whitby. Now, once you get down to Whitby, then we've got the train. So they started off from Prince Albert first thing in the morning in July, uh, July or something in, uh, in 1866 and did their strutting and they got down uh, uh, to a couple of miles uh, and don't tell anybody, but between Port Prince Albert and Whitby, their destination, there were seven taverns. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Fatal. Fatal. So the first tavern, of course, they marched up, and of course the uh, tavern owner was so happy to see them and proud of these great men, and so he was free with his uh, handing out. They got down to another one, the one at Raglan. Same thing. They got down to uh, what, what is now Brooklyn. Same thing. By the time they got to Whitby to get on the train, they were feeling no pain at all, and they had a difficulty establishing any sense of direction. So they decided to sleep it off in, uh, in, in, in the Whitby station, so they did. Then the next morning, they got on the train and went off to Toronto. Well, their job was uh, simply to supervise the, the Toronto jail where the captured Fenians had been incarcerated. And so uh, Captain Foreman uh, allotted his men and they did all that they had to do to make sure that these Fenians were, were properly dealt with and, and handled and incarcerated and all that goes with that. And so they stayed for two weeks looking after the, uh, the prisoners uh, of the Fenian raids. And then they said, the administrators of the, um, of the militia said, right, you have done your duty, honorable man, wonderful, we thank you. So they started back again. Tavern at uh, Brooklyn, <laughs> and so on. And it was hilarious. By the time they got back to Prince Albert, there was a huge reception committee, but they were all nearly passed out. <laughs> so it was, it was hilarious. Um, anyway, they had this huge ceremony, and the report of it in the, in the uh, newspaper was just hilarious, because whoever was, was looking after this huge banquet for these guys, um, he had 97, I exaggerate, 97 toasts proposed for this, for the Queen, for the members of the press, for the Mayor, for the Reeve, for Captain Foreman, and so on. That went all, now these lads have already been liquidated on the way up, so you imagine what they would be like after that evening. So anyway, and, and then each of them was presented with, of course, the usual Fenian medal. And in our archives, we have one of those medals. And we also have Captain Foreman's hat, because as a result of his contribution to the war against the Fenians, he was promoted to major. And thereafter, the rest of his life, he was referred to as the major. But 
uh, I should tell you, 1866, this is July of 1866. Um, well, in April 1863, his mar wife, Margaret Lang, died at the age of 39. Exactly a year later, his 15-month-old daughter, Janet, died. In 1865, his nine-year-old daughter, Annie, died. And in the year of the Fenian raids, an infant son from his second marriage to Eleanor Taylor died. Mm -hmm. And Margaret Foreman, uh, who was born a month uh, later, uh, also died. And then, I'm sorry, Margaret Foreman died in her 23rd year in 1888. So it was not an easy time for Major Foreman. And when the train came, of course, um, the, gr the grain business in Prince Albert was just eliminated. And he moved to Port Perry and set up a general store and, um, and uh, lived in uh, quiet but comfortable circumstances for the rest of his life. He had two sons. Uh, one went into business with him, but they eventually they moved off to um, other places in Ontario. Uh, one in Ingersoll, one in uh, Woodstock. Um, but anyway, I've always had this greatest respect for uh, T.C. Foreman, Thomas Chalmers uh, Foreman. Interesting fellow. Um, now, um, I should, uh, I, I want to dwell a little bit on this business of the uh, of the tragedies of the cemetery. There are a lot of happy stories in, in the cemetery, and I'm going to tell you one actually marvelous romantic story as we get towards the end. But I sh should reiterate what, we, what you will do when you're going out looking at cemeteries, you become well, well aware of the, the frequent occurrence of the same date on tombstones. And a lot of that, particularly in the 1860s, uh, and 70s and 80s is due to various outbreaks of cholera, typhoid, uh, influenza, and of course all the childhood diseases that today we, we get inoculated for, they had no treatment for them in those days. So the people who were attacked were, you, were the children and the elderly. And um, I'm going to give you a very quick one. Um, the influenza epidemic, there's an inf several inf influenza epidemics. One in 1881 made its way through the Robinson family. Uh, George and his wife Elizabeth Brooks celebrated their son's bir first birthday on June the 6th, 1881. A week later, he died. Less than a week after that, their daughter Florence Maud died. She was only a few days away from her third birthday. And to compound this tragedy, George's mother died October the 15th, 1881. She was 59 years old. So there you get the young and the old. And four years later, on October the 19th, 1885, their three-year-old son died. And two years after that, their infant son Norman died, only three days after his first birthday. What tragedies? but I'm going to tell you the worst one, which we will cover when uh, on the walk, and that is, it's to the Moon family, M-O-O-N, to uh, James and his wife Catherine. The monument is a lovely uh, kind of reddish maroon granite monument, and it's got a simple inscription on there. This is what it says. This is all it says. James Moon, 1819 to 1896. Wife Catherine, 1830 to 1916. And nine infant children. Now, how do you live through that? How do you live through that kind of tragedy? It's, uh, it's just mind boggling. Uh, the worst year for them, um, uh, the cholera epidemic of uh, 1876. On July 20th, their daughter Sarah died. On September 7th, their daughter Susan died. A week later, their daughter Maria died. I mean, how do you handle that kind of emotional trauma? I, I don't know. But they did. They survived. 
They must have been tough, hardy people. Emotionally, I have no doubt there's a lot of damage caused by that, but that somehow or other they survived without grief counselors. Uh, how are we doing for time here? Okay. Um, I'm going to throw a problem at you, which is a problem that has confounded me and everybody that comes to Prince Albert Cemetery. The grave of William Decker, D-E-C-K-E-R, obviously German, William Decker. The obituary states William Decker. The death certificate says William Decker. But the grave says William Dahl. Within a few weeks of William Decker's death, his widow advertised that she was going to continue his jewelry shop Mrs. Dahl, formerly Decker. Now the Deckers had five children, Bertha, Eliza, Franz, Ludwig, and William, and all their births are registered as Decker. In the 1871 census, they're all recognized as Decker. But then, in the 1881 survey, they're all listed as Dahl. Bertha, Franz, and William are buried right beside him in the same plot, also named Dahl. Now, the widow, uh, Christiana Decker slash Dahl, um, remarried in 1869 to John Diesfeld, another German, who had been born in Germany in 1833. He arrived in Prince Albert in 1867, and after the marriage, the Prince Albert jewelry store was continued as the Diesfeld name. And then the Diasfelds joined the migration from Prince Albert to Port Perry in 1871 when the train came and they had a store, if you know Port Perry, uh, you know where the wee tartan shop is? Okay, that was the Diasfeld jewelry store. It was known as Diamond Hall. And until the town, the, uh, the post office was built with a clock in it, uh, Mr. De uh, the, the Decker doll Diasfelds had a a post on the sidewalk with a two-faced clock on there, and that was how people told time in those days before the uh, before the uh, post office. Anyway, um, they, the the uh, Desfelds had three children of their own. Two died in an infancy, and all are also buried in that plot, uh, and and so on. Anyway, I have not been able to figure out why the name was changed to Dahl. Why the name Dahl suddenly occurs, why William uh, Decker suddenly becomes William Dahl, or is, is buried as William Dahl. If any of you have any idea as to a potential possibility why that would take place, I'd appreciate your suggestions. They changed, changed the name, the spelling right. of the name. Okay. Um, so maybe when they came over, they went to Decker, but they decided to... No, they used the name Decker. They used the name, and the advertising for the jewelry store is Decker in Prince Albert. And then when he's buried, he's buried as doll. Yeah. It's possible that there's something to do with their, with their German heritage. They were both German. Mm -hmm. uh, Anyway, Bob? Well, my McClintocks from up there, apparently it was a McClintock female, very quickly male, and there's different versions of it, but he might have been a bigamist, or even worse, a Catholic. She took, or he took her name, so if he was trying to hide and was going under the assumed Decker name, he then dies, there's no... He's you know, immune for prosecution, so they revert back to his legal name. Like, so he was a big investor. Right. Yeah, okay. There's, man. Yeah, there's a possibility there, yeah. Something to do with what was going on in, in uh, what is now Germany at, at the time, yeah. I haven't explored that. That's, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. And the story was, is our, our one, he was a big list, and uh, that, there was title involved and all that, and that's why he took her name. 
Interesting. Okay, now I'm, I'm going to, uh, uh, I've mentioned briefly the Bruce family, um, Dr. H.A. Bruce, and I'll repeat, um, he graduated from Port Perry High School, went on to medical school along with Campbell, and the two of them were buddies at, uh, at medical school, and Campbell went to Flint, Michigan, and hooked up with Willie Durant, and H.A. Uh, uh, Bruce stayed in Toronto, found Wellesley Hospital, became the Chief of Medical Staff for the Canadian Armed Forces in uh, 1914, and then wrote a scathing report criticizing the Canadian government uh, for their care, their lack of care of the Canadian Armed Forces in, in, uh, in, in uh, Europe, and he quit, he resigned, uh, or he was pushed, uh, and uh, he went to work for the, uh, for the French government and the French army. And uh, he, he was, uh, oh, he was viciously critical of what, of the way Canadians, Canadian troops, wounded Canadian troops were being treated in, uh, in Europe. Um, uh, anyway, um, so he, um, his family, the whole of the Bruce family, his parents, his brothers and sisters, he had a brother, by the way, H.A. Uh, Bruce had a brother who was the founder of CIL. It wasn't called CIL when he founded it, but he, the company became CIL, and he was the founder of that. That was um, Rupert Bruce. Um, that's an interesting one. Um, what else can I tell you about the Bruce family? Just an amazing family. They have one of the most impressive family plots in, uh, in the Pine Grove Cemetery. Uh, a lovely kind of Grecian <coughs> monument and then the, the uh, headstones for all the various members of the family. Um, oh yes, I have to tell you about uh, Milton McDermott. Um, Milton McDermott was 25 year old, was the head clerk at Foreman's General Store. I've been telling you about T.C. Foreman. So the man who worked for him was Milton McDermott. And uh, on the morning of Saturday, April the 20th, 1912, he awoke to find that he had a severely sore throat. So before opening the store at Foreman's, he made his way to Flint, Flint's drug store, which is where Dana's jewelry is in Port Perry today, in order to get some medication. But he got there before the store was open. But he knew where Mr. Flint kept his medicines. <laughs> And so he, there was a young lad who was there kind of looking after things. So McDermott, anyway, went to, uh, to find the bottles uh, where he, he had these throat remedies and so on. And of course, the throat remedies were largely whiskey at the time. And he told the boy what he had taken and uh, said that he would drop by later to see Mr. Flint and settle his bill. Uh, and uh, so he went off to work to Mr. Foreman's store. A few minutes later, Mr. Flint, the druggist, arrived in the store. The young lad explained what had happened, and Mr. Flint's face went ashen white because he went to look at the bottle, and what he had consumed was tincture of aconite which is a highly toxic stuff used to kill rodents and plants. And... Anyway, so uh, immediately Flint ran off to Foreman's store and poor Milton McDermott was already on the floor gagging. They called for the doctor and eventually three doctors turned up. They couldn't do anything for poor old Wilson. Um, he was pronounced dead at 11 o'clock in the morning. Dr. Mallow, who was the coroner, called for an inquest the following morning. And Mr. Flint was reprimanded for not being present in his drugstore when the door was open and told to make sure that in future a competent chemist would be on a hand at any time the front door of the store was open. Mr. Flint, of course, was obviously overcome with grief. He quickly sold his store and his home and he left the community but to return. So the moral of the story is, always read the label. <laughs> okay, now I, I'm going to, uh, we're getting close to the end here. I'm, I'm going to read you a romantic one now, all right? Sit back, relax, and remember the days of your youth. I'm going to tell you about um, uh, James Stonehouse. 
and that's in the north end of the cemetery, not too far from the, uh, from the Cannon Bull Monument. Um, the Stonehouse people, family, had a large furniture store, and of course they built coffins, so hence were undertakers too. Um, and uh, he was invited on December 1871 to a party at the home of uh, Mr. Christie, who was the MP for uh, North Ontario. That's North Ontario County. Uh, Mr. Christie had a daughter, and the uh, <coughs> daughter, her name was Elizabeth. Now, the delight in all of this story is that Elizabeth kept a diary. Her entire life, daily, she wrote down something and she kept an incredible diary. Her diary for Thursday, uh, well, um, first of all, um, uh, James Stonehouse had gone to this party. Uh, this is on December the 28th, 1871. He'd gone to this party at the Christie house where this very attractive and eligible young Christie girl was located. And he got sick. And he, they, the Christie family was so concerned, they said, well, you better stay overnight. <laughs> Great. And then he stayed several nights. And Mrs. Christie uh, entertained him, looked after him, cared for him. I bet she did. <laughs> and anyway, on New Year's Day of 1872, Miss Christie wrote the following in it diary. Here we go. After dinner, we talked a while upon different things. When he arose, this is James Stonehouse, and closed the door, drew up a chair, and sat beside me, and made me an offer of his heart and hand. He said that he loved me, but he would have to restrain himself until my answer was given. I was very excited and nervous. I, I promised to take his proposal into consideration and to answer him at some future time. My heart has been in a flutter ever since. There is nothing to him which I can object. In appearance, he is rather good looking, about medium height, dark hair, eyes, and a fine, serious ex expression, a long, well shaped nose. Eat your heart out. <laughs> Brown mustache, whiskers, Grand Duke Alexis style. He is deep and does not show his feelings in, and is of a very respectable family. My opinion is that I would be happier as his wife than to live single as I am. But inclination must yield to beauty. They parted. She promised to give him her answer in due time. Now, gentlemen, you know when a woman says due time, that means anything between six weeks and six years. <laughs> James and Elizabeth met frequently at social and church gatherings, and he repeatedly asked her if she had reached a decision. Finally, on July the 8th, her diary. My heart is sadder than it has been for years. Yesterday I rejected the proposal made to me by Mr. Stonehouse on New Year's Day. He drove me home with his ponies and coming up the road I told him I considered it my duty to remain with my mother and brother. But I hoped that I would still retain his friendship. He came in and stayed for a few minutes, and after he went away, I was quite affected. I went to my bedroom and wept continuously, for I'm afraid that I will regret it yet, for he is a kind and honorable and good man. A week later, she wrote in her diary, Why is it that so many men have loved me? Newbury, Frank Marr, then Mr. Sharp, and Billy Tummins, and Harry Reynolds, and James Stonehouse, and now 
Eric Edmondson. The diary continued until her death at the age of 100 in 1944. She never married. <laughs> she stayed home to look after her mother, who died at the age, in 1903, who died at the age of 96. <laughs> James Stonehouse later remarried, and he died while on vacation in North Dakota in 1924, and he is buried in the Prince Albert Cemetery. Now, I think we probably better wrap it up here. No, I'm not going to wrap it up because I got to very quickly. Joel Aldred. How many of you know Joel Aldred? All right, you know the name Joel Aldred. He was the guy who, well, he was a CBC announcer initially, and then became uh, the voice of the Bob Hope Show, the Dinah Shore Show. Uh, I don't know all kinds of television stuff. And um, anyway, he was uh, born in Toronto, but raised. Uh, his family moved to Port Perry when he was a kid. <coughs> And he, uh, he went to, obviously, to Port Perry High School and so on. The family lived there. And uh, I found out, to his embarrassment, that uh, when he was at high school, uh, back in the, in the 30s, he was on the school basketball team and is the only kid recorded in that school ever to, to have uh, scored on his own basket. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, I knew Joel very well. And um, so anyway, uh, Joel went on to, uh, to great fame and fortune, and also uh, he was the founder of what is now known as CTV, because he bought out, uh, he and, um, oh, who were they? There was um, this Foster Hewitt, Bassett, and there was another guy, I've forgotten who the other one, uh, anyway, they bought the first uh, allowable TV station away from the government, CBC, the government. And that was uh, when in the 1950s, and uh, it was originally called the the Aldred uh, Broadcasting Company, and then they eventually it became um, a, a CF2, a CFTO, and then it became CTV. And Joel, of course, um, died uh, just uh, two years ago um, at the age of uh, 90, and he is buried. And when you come and take part in our walk, I'll give you a lot more about him. Uh, fascinating fellow. Now, I'm going to uh, close with two things. First of all, the NHL All-Star, no, three things. I told you an NHL All-Star? All right. What, did the, what was the original name of the Toronto Maple Leafs? St. Patrick's. St. Patrick's won the Stanley Cup, believe it or not. St. Patrick's won the Stanley Cup in 1921-22, and their goalie, was John Ross Roach, R-O-A-C-H. John was born in Port Perry, raised in Port Perry, Port Perry High School and so on. Um, so his first season in the NHL was the goalie at, uh, with the St. Pat's team. And uh, he was in the goal. Uh, he stayed with the Pats through their name change until 1928 when he was transferred to the New York Rangers. And he led the Rangers to the Stanley Cup in 1932, but unfortunately the Rangers lost out to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yes, the Maple Leafs did win the Stanley Cup. <laughs> um, and then he briefly had a season with the Detroit. Uh, he was an NHL, the NHL All-Star all -star goalie in 1933-34. Um, and he, of course, is buried in, uh, in Prince Albert Cemetery. An amazing man. I don't know why he never made the, uh, the Hockey Hall of Fame, um, but an, an amazing accomplishment. Um, he led the NHL in wins in 24-25. He led the NHL in playoff games played in 21-22. He led the NHL in, uh, in playoff wins. He led the NHL in playoff minutes played and in playoff shutouts. John Ross Roach. One last one. I said there was a movie star buried in the, in the cemetery in Prince Albert. There is. His name was Craig Eady. Ever heard of him? All right. Try Craig Russell. Female impersonator, the movie, outrageous. Uh, 
and it won all kinds of awards. This is back in, what, the 60s or 70s? It became a cult film. He's a female impersonator, and he made an immense name for himself as an impersonator of Carol Channing and Judy Garland and who else coming? Anyway, Beth Midler and so on. And uh, he did the rounds, and that's what the film was about. It's, that's why it's called Outrageous. Uh, then there was a sequel to the movie called Outrageous 2. He starred in both of them. Um, and he, uh, he married, um, but he died of AIDS. And uh, he's buried in the Prince Albert Cemetery, and uh, his wife is right beside him. Okay, um, I'm going to close off, if I can find my little piece here. Yes, I can. I'm going to close off by talking about, just reading you very briefly, the final epilogue in the book. This is kind of incentive to buy a book. <laughs> On November the 5th, 1859, John Johnson died in Prince Albert. He was only 26 years old. And on his headstone, we read the following. Now take this in. All you that passed by cast an eye. And while you read the fate of me, think of the fate that awaits for thee. <laughs> Where you are now, there once was I. Where I am now, there you must be. Therefore, prepare to follow me. <laughs> July the 3rd, 2 o'clock. Prince Albert Cemetery, and we meet at the South End, and there's no charge, um, and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. Uh, the books are on sale there if you want them. Uh, any questions? Are the names uh, of the burials in that? Yeah, yeah. The, the book has, uh, I've, uh, what I've done in this, there are, as I say, there are 8,000 burials, but what I've done, I've done 80 of them. Now the 80 are listed in here. Plus, I listed all those who, uh, uh, all of that's who died in the two wars. Um, but uh, it, it, impossible to put all of the uh, 8,000 there. But you have, you have the 8,000 in the, well, most of them anyway, from, in, the, in the listing, the, the, um, the sanitary listing. There are four, sec four sections, I think. Anyway, um, but uh, yeah, the OTS has the, uh, um, so what I've done, and it's illustrated too, um, and uh, as John Ross wrote, um, and uh, yeah, there's some interesting pictures. So anyway, um, that's the book on the cemetery, ten dollars. Is it the only cemetery in the area? No, no, no. With lots of cemeteries, it's the biggest. Um, uh, there's. Um, Okay, I mentioned briefly the uh, First Nation burial ground. Uh, there are no markers on that. Uh, there's a Catholic cemetery on 7 a near Senko Street. Uh, there's a Presbyterian, Presbyterian cemetery called Radalbain at the Utica. Um, uh, on the island, there are several cemeteries. There's the Head Cemetery at the church, uh, the, at the Museum of Church. Uh, there's the Scoville Cemetery in the middle. And then um, uh, out, in, uh, out in Cartwright, of course, um, uh, there's, a, um, there's a, uh, another very large cemetery, the St. John Cemetery, at the old location of the old original Anglican Church, which burned down in the 1860s. Uh, it's almost a canvas. And that's, that's a large cemetery. That's all covered in here. Um, I've seen the picture of the uh, gravestone, but I don't know which cemetery. Sometime in the next 12 months. I'm working on the Nettentower, oh. the railway that ran from 
along with me to Port Perry and then Lemonsky. I've got the, uh, all the research done, um, and uh, it's a matter of editing now and putting together all the. Uh, I've got about uh, 7,000 photographs, I have to sift through which ones and so on. But uh, to answer your question, it will be on the way. Oh, I just thought I'd throw a, there's a little saying that goes after that tombstone saying yes. that you just read, the monument saying. And it goes something like this. To follow you, I am not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> I love it. Love it. Thank you. Good. Good. Paul, thank you very much. That was no, I really appreciate it. interesting. My pleasure. I've done a couple of the cemetery blogs as well. I learn something new every time I hear you talk about it. So thank you very much for making cemeteries even more interesting. And Jimmy, I'll just find you anyway. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I, I'm sorry I, I can't stay beyond the break. I've got to pick up my son who's planning for Fort McMurray tonight. Well, just before we have the break, um, we were at conference and we were approached, or, or one of our uh, attendees, our, our table volunteers, which by the way I should mention, there was Karen, there was Anne who was in charge of the whole thing, myself, Janice, and Stacy. And we had a, a, a good turnout at our table. But one of them, and was it Stacy? I don't remember. One of them went wandering over to the internet genealogy in your family today booth, which is Moorshead uh, Publishing, and they, they apparently have just recently, or maybe just last year recently, uh, moved out to the, put their headquarters in Ajax, and they asked us if we wanted all the books that they get for reviews for their magazines. And, so and we said yes! <laughs> Of course we'll take the books. So in the break, have a browse and, and see what we've gotten for our library and our office. If the, if the Whitby Library has a copy of it, we'll keep it at the office. Um, otherwise, it will go into our uh, branch library at the Whitby Public Library. So there's also, also a book that we purchased. Uh, it's called Upper Canada Justice, Volume 4. So it's all kinds of... Uh, court Someone cases. has gone through all the uh, court cases at, at a certain level um, and has indexed them for us. And Linda Karup is amazing. And, and there's a couple of um, Oshawa City directories that are usually in our office, but I took them for samples and I haven't taken them back yet, so if you want to look at them while they're here. Moore's Head uh, Magazine. Did she come to our table? Thanks, Janice, for correcting me. So now we'll take a break. I would suggest 20 minutes or so. Um, feel free to catch Paul, ask him questions, buy a book, whatever you want, and browse what we brought back from conference. So we'll do a little bit of business here. Um, B, did you have any correspondence? Okay, I've got three of them. Um, oh, is that better? Probably. Okay, I'll read out the date um, because this is the correspondence that comes in either via snail mail or uh, email. And uh, if you're interested in the names that they're researching, then um, remember the date. So the date is the 3rd or the 8th of uh, March 2016. And it's um, George Fraser Monroe Children Baptism, Wesleyan Methodist, Whitby, Ontario. Um, they, this person lives in Texas and uh, they want to know about the um, birth dates for the Monroe group uh, that's in the um, 
Wesleyan Methodist Church Index, um, and that's the basics of all that he gave on that. And again, that was the uh, 8th of March, and it was uh, Chuck Monroe. The next one is uh, on the 17th of March, 2016, and uh, he's looking for the, or uh, she is looking for, her grandfather, Milton Robert Whitlow, W-H-I-T-L-O, who was orphaned within five years of his birth, allegedly in Ontario, January 12, 1874. He was raised in Illinois by Charles Mitchell and Mary Smart Mitchell, and married their granddaughter. Suzanne Naomi Sykes, daughter of George Sykes and Jane, Jane Mitchell Sykes. Um, he suspects, because he's done DNA, that their um, family genetic name is Bain uh, rather than uh, Whitlow, and uh, wanted to know if there was any Bains in the Whitby area. And again, that uh, was, well, that's Susan L. Classen, and that's the 17th of March. The next one comes to us on the 12th of March. Um, I'm the great, great niece of James Harrison, who was the first person in the world to construct a machine that could make ice by artificial means. He's the father of refrigeration. His grandson is now an elderly gentleman, so I'm writing to you on his behalf. I'm hoping that you may have some descendants of James Hamilton Harrison and Sarah Amelia Hubbard's family as members of your society. If so, I'd like to make contact with them. James Harrison. James Hamilton Harrison was the inventor's son. He and Amelia settled at Myrtle Station in about 1885. James Jr. was born at Geelong, Victoria, Australia, 1862, and died at Myrtle Station in 1907 of typhoid. His wife may have married someone else with the surname of Long after her husband died. I am aware that it might be important for James' living descendants in Ontario to know about his invention, and it would be nice if they were interested in making contact with the Harrison family in Australia. The family here has always been under the impression that they were the inventor's only descendants, as all contact with James Hamilton Harrison's family was lost after he went to Canada. Here are the details that I have about James Hamilton Harrison's children. Wilmer born, 1886. Clarence born, 1887. Fred born, 1890. Gordon born, 1896. Died in 1906 of meningitis and typhoid. Frank born 1898, Gladys Irene 1901. She married Herbert Boy Scott. Um, their children were Kenneth born 1921, York County. Harold born 1923, died 1963, Bar Barry. Beverly, a male, born 1926, died 1990, Toronto. Um, I think one of them is, was in the Canadian Air Force during World War II, and another may have been in the Army. Should any of the uh, family be members of your society, I'd be grateful if they pass on my contact details to them. Uh, many thanks and best wishes from Australia. And that's Vicki Chin from Canabera. And uh, that was the uh, March 12th. Do you have a treasurer's report for us, uh, Sheila? For the month of May, we had um, $547.83 in withdrawals. Our uh, deposits were $460.85. We got a check from OGS, $406. That included $368 for membership fees and $38 for donations. And so our balance is $8,241.01. Now Joyce is uh, not well tonight, so I get to do the upcoming meetings. We'll be here September 6th uh, with uh, Christine Ferguson from the uh, Family History Center in the local Mormon church, and she's going to tell us what resources they have there. 
And on October the 4th, uh, we have two members of the Irish Palatine Special Interest Group uh, from OGS. So it's a province-wide virtual group. And they're going to come and talk us, to us about the tour that they did visiting areas of uh, old Ontario County uh, where the Irish Palatine settled. So that will be interesting, particularly if you think you have both Irish and Palatine roots. Now, we've put together a program survey. Now, where did John disappear? He must have known I was going to talk about it. John will be sending it to you. John Alford is our uh, membership coordinator, and it will be either by his email address or by MailChimp, but it will be coming out very shortly. He promised me it would be coming out very shortly. So it's just going to be a, a survey monkey. Uh, oh, your ears must be burning, John. <laughs> so you are sending out the survey very, very shortly. Almost as we speak. Almost <laughs> as we speak. Yay. So it's just, there'll be a link to, to go through to the survey, and there's really only three questions, even though it looks huge, because we've given you lots of places you can tick mark off answers. You don't have to do a lot of typing, just a bunch of ticking, to let us know the topics that you're interested in, so we can plan our program for the next year. And our upcoming DNA special interest group, it will be meeting Wednesday, June the 15th at uh, 7.30 p.m. And what we'll do is the members from that group that were able to attend DNA lectures at the conference this pa past weekend will be passing on what they learned, hopefully. And Steve and I are going to show how we figured out we're cousins, <laughs> DNA-wise. We already knew we were very distant cousins. But now we've figured out the exact relationship. And um, should I tell them what it is? Sure, and you were correct on the email. Six cousins for once removed. <laughs> <laughs> He's the only one here that I'm related to. <laughs> Except maybe Janice. We have a possible Vint connection, but we haven't proven that one yet. But Janice and I are definitely connected, just not to each other, but our, our spouses or ex spouses are really. Okay. So link there, link there. <laughs> one ex spouse and one current spouse. I hope you haven't made an ex of Laurie yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, was that a secret? <laughs> anyway, um, last month I mentioned a workshop up in Peterborough called What's Your God? And Corth Branch was going to bring in archives and libraries and organizations just to say what kind of resources they have. Unfortunately, they've had to postpone their uh, workshop until further notice. Now, there's lots of opportunities this summer and early fall of things you can go to. And I'm, you're going to hear about them. Okay. So the first one I could find was in August. It's August the 19th in Brampton. It's the uh, a workshop put on by the OGS Scottish Special Interest Group. They call it a symposium. So they've got five speakers. It's uh, on Friday at the uh, Courtyard Marriott Hotel in Brampton. And on their website, they have a special code for the accommodation at that hotel. And the reason you might need that code is there's something else happening the next day, which is at the uh, Brampton stake of the uh, Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon Church. Uh, this is the seventh year they've put on a family history conference. It's a one-day conference. Um, and the early bird deadline to pay to get the $22 rate instead of the $27 rate is uh, July 2nd. But look at all they have. They're going to be having about six or seven concurrent, oh, we have something at the back, John is waving at me. You have more information about it? Well, I have a brochure up here as well. And the, the top topics are 
very wide ranging. Swedish, Czech, Polish, Irish, Hispanic, English, Canadian, West Indian, Scots, as well as DNA. Fam and then they're talking about family search, ancestry, freeware, reunions, and Barnardo children. And some of the speakers I recognize as being pretty high up there in the genealogy speaking world. Ed Zapletel, Nola Farrell Griffin, Leslie Anderson, Christine Woodcock, Ivy Susie, and Kathleen Labudi Shackle. So, good range of topics. Uh, I think I was there at least twice in the last five years, and always interesting. Yes, sir. I just want to say this conference will be in Oshawa next year. Oh, really? Yes. That's I'm, awesome. I'm in charge of it. <laughs> for sure. Thank, thank you for the warning. Then, yeah. <laughs> will it will it be a summertime one as well? Yes. Okay. We'll look forward to it. And I'm sure Christine, when she's here in September, she'll tell us more about it. Will she? Yeah. Good. Now, early September, the British Isles Family History Society of Greater Ottawa, or for short form, the Fisco. Uh, they're putting on their three-day conference with the themes of Irish family history and DNA and genealogy. And they have some great speakers. Morris Gleason, who we saw at this meeting last year, who had just finished the conference up in Barrie. Kyle Bedev, who is out of uh, Salt Lake City. Leslie Anderson, Ruth Blair, and Glenn Wright. And the deadline for that early bird deadline for that one is August the 5th. Here's one that uh, our booth was right across from, from the uh, gentleman from the Canadian Friends Historical Association. So they're holding a one day event on September 24th. If, I don't know if you can see that. It says mark this date, 9th month, 24th, 2016. That means September. The, the Quakers always felt that the names of uh, the months were um, pagan, so they went with a simple, simple numerical way of designating their months. They they're going to have their AGM, but then there's going to be a bus tour in the afternoon of notable Quaker sites with Alan McGilvery. Now, he's been a speaker with us, and he's always interesting. Then they're having dinner and a keynote speaker with Alan. So it, uh, it would be very interesting if you have any Quaker um, relations at all. The next one I've mentioned before, and that's the Great Canadian Genealogy Summit. That one is October 21 to 23, so you're going to hear about it again. Uh, again, speakers, Ruth Blair, Mike Quackenbush, Christine Woodcock, Catherine Lake Hope and Hogan, uh, Louise Sandini, these are all uh, Ontario uh, speakers. Then they've also got Jennifer De Bruyne, and I think Lynn Palermo is also from Quebec. I could be wrong on that one. Friday, they're going to have a research day at the Ontario Archives, and they'll be offering a bus service from the hotel to the archives. Also on Friday, at the archives, there's going to be a, a loyalist research workshop. So if you have loyalist connections and are having trouble with the research, you're going to be able to sit down for this pre-conference extra charge workshop uh, with Catherine Lake Hogan, who has been the Dominion genealogist for the United Empire Loyalty. Loyalist Association of Canada. Why do we have to have such long names? And, um, oops, that doesn't work. Um, some of the topics include Canadian censuses, Upper Canada, French Canadian, Irish English. Uh, I can't remember some of the rest. But the website is there, cangensummit.ca. Go check it out. Don't forget our workshop, which is the following weekend, with Ruth Blair. And I also have handouts. They drop by our uh, 
table at conference for conference 2017. Our Canada, your family, building a nation. The Ottawa branch is hosting and it's going to be June 16 to 18 at Algonquin College. I have, the brochures will give you a list of the speakers and the topics. They're doing, they've, done, they've got their complete program set already. Now, who was at conference and attended some sessions that they want to talk about? B? That was the first, first hand I saw. Come on. Come and tell us the one you like the best. Okay. Just a bit about it. Just has to be very long. As long as you want. But I went to the workshops on the Friday, and uh, I went to one that said, no vitals, no problem. Well, that was amazing. She had a census of uh, Augusta Robertson and an Isabel. He was 20, she was 18, and there was a three and a half year old child and a 11 month old child. And then there was a Mr. Robinson who owned the property they lived in. So we didn't know if they were the children. She didn't know if they were the children and, and whatnot or if Gustav and Isabel were married because they didn't know Isabel's maiden name. Well, the whole program was about finding out because she couldn't find a birth certificate, she couldn't find a death certificate, she couldn't find a marriage certificate, she could find them on the census, but she couldn't find them anywhere else. And then they disappeared. She found them in Texas eventually. Now she was going through, they were in Mississippi, so they moved to Texas. And then she started finding births of children she found eventually their marriage um, by a circuitous route because they weren't married in the county that they were in. Um, and she had looked all around and most of the counties they had burned, the buildings had burned because they were uh, wood instead of uh, cement or, um, or uh, brick. And uh, it was really, really circuitous. It wasn't until her death certificate, which her youngest daughter uh, said she was born in Texas, she was not, she was born in Mississippi, but said that her maiden name was Gentry. There was another name that came along the way and they um, found that um, she could have had three um, maiden names. Which one could they find? So they went, she went back to Mississippi and she started going through the censuses for each of the names that she had and could uh, Isabel have fit in with the age that she was, because she would have been 16, 15, 16 when she had her first child. Not unusual for that area. Um, that's what she told us. And she said that um, she looked in two of them and that there was not enough room between children for Isabel to have fit in. And when she finally went to the gentry, which was the one, the name, the last name that came up, she found actually Isabel listed in one of the earlier censuses. So she assumed that her maiden name was Gentry. Um, when she did that, she could actually go back and find the marriage certificate because she had no idea looking for the marriage certificate what her maiden name was and whether Gustav and Isabel. And they also came to find out that it wasn't Robertson, it was Robinson. So it was very, it was a very interesting two and a half hours finding all this out, but seeing the circuitous way that she went about. Yes, it was U.S., but still the circuitous way that she went about trying to find out who this lady really was. So it was really interesting. Thanks, Pete. Okay, Janice, I know you were there. Do you have Do you have one that uh, oh, I guess. you enjoyed enjoyed particularly? I found them all interesting, all worth going to. I don't know that it's really hard to separate one from the other, but I, another one, I went to another workshop, same as B did, so we had to pay extra to do these workshops on a Friday. They weren't part of the conference in general. But I did one on, on um, Google, and I have Google as my homepage on my computer, and if I want to look up some music, or who sang what, or who played in what movie and that kind of stuff. I go to Google all the time, I look it up, but I went to a workshop on using Google strictly for your ge um, genealogy. And I, it was just amazing, all this, the uses that I didn't know were there or I would have never thought of for genealogy. And um, on the Google toolbar where you 
type in what you want to look up and up comes your, all your items that it finds and across the top, and I never pay attention to all these title bars and everything, and there's Google Books and there's Google... Images? Yeah, images and... Uh, of course maps. And news. And Google News and I knew Google Maps, I knew Google Earth. I didn't know about all these other things. It, it was really interesting, all the different things that you can hunt up on Google just to tie in. Um, one thing that amazed me is she said she, she had a picture of a location, like just a scenery picture. And she somehow posted that on Google and, or went through the images and found a complete match and found out exactly where it was, again in the States. But that's a lot of pictures to go through in the States to find a <laughs> location. So it was really interesting. Just a note on, on that Google picture thing. I've played with that a little bit, and what you do is you have a picture, and you and you go to Google Images, yeah. and then you drag the picture into the search field, and it worked once out of about four or five times for me. Probably what I picked wasn't famous enough or photographed enough, but it worked at least once for me, so it was very interesting that way. Karen. Karen, you were there. Come on up. What did you see that impressed you? I'm not certain. Okay. <laughs> provided a workshop on what's new in Irish records, which is very important to me because so many of my ancestors are from Ireland. Um, I think for people that have a background in um, Catholicism, where their ancestors were for the, from the part of the Roman Catholic Church, this would have been a marvelous uh, presentation to attend because there's so many new records that are coming out from the uh, Catholic Church in Northern Ireland in particular. So, um, and he focused on that quite a bit, which was uh, quite, quite interesting. But the syllabus that, was av that is available to uh, members, um, he has listed at the bottom his blog um, of where you can get the information that he provided at the workshop. Plus, he also had his lecture uh, taped. So in the next two weeks, it's going to be available to listen to. And I have to tell you, um, it was I talked to others at the workshop. It was impossible to write down the various websites that are available now to look for your ancestors, what, what, the way he went through the list, because there's so many. He said, I'm going to be talking very rapidly for 50 minutes, five minutes, and he did, because he had so many to go through. But the best part is you can go to YouTube where he will have his lecture available in two weeks time and uh, you can download it and you can go through it and start recording or writing down the websites that you want to check out and there's a lot of new ones. So for me, I mean, I didn't know Ancestry was providing um, information on members of the Freemason, uh, Freemason members. So I'm, do, I'm working on that now because one of my ancestors was very proud of being a Freemason. Um, and there's another section that's fairly new on wills and probates. Um, so he talked a lot about it, but there's other, other areas where you have to, um, you really have to go to the YouTube, I would suggest, and look up all the details. But it was fascinating. I mean, he, he started going through the list and he just couldn't keep up with all the new information. He said in the next five years, things are gonna really be turned around with uh, people that want to research your Irish ancestors, so that's exciting. And that was about it. What's his name again? Morris Gleason. He was okay. here last year. He gave a lecture, he, he gave a lecture here last year on DNA, oh, okay. and it's Morris spelled like Maurice Richard. Yeah. Oh, okay. And Gleason, G-L-E-E-S-O-N, and if you just put his name into YouTube, even before this other one comes up, he's got at least, I don't know, 12 or 15 of them up there already. A lot of them on DNA, he's very big on DNA, but he's a doctor. 
but um, he's also, of course, got all the Irish uh, background because that's how he's using the DNA to break through these Irish brick walls that the loss of records have left us with. Okay, is there anybody I haven't uh, singled out? And you made it to one lecture. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I, actually, I went to the I went to the keynote lecture too. But I don't remember the name of that lady. You remember, I'm sure. Uh, was that the legal Jenny Ellis? Yes. Judy Russell. Judy Russell. Yeah. Okay, so I went, went, actually went to two talks of hers. Um, one was about the ethics of genealogy. And so that was a little bit different because most of the time you go to, to uh, workshops and they're about how to find information. This is, was about what to do when you find information. <laughs> and she talked about um, sometimes the conflict between uh, truthfulness and tact you know so uh, what do you do if you find out information about family members uh, that, that affects them and they don't know it you know and uh, on the other hand so it, it was kind of very interesting uh, kind of uh, complex at times so she, she went through uh, quite a few examples of things that uh, situations, you know, that could come up uh, because, and, and of course, uh, we're going to have more and more of those with this new DNA information, aren't we? <laughs> you know? um, the other talk I went to of hers was a, a, about uh, researching online without using the uh, big name databases um, and uh, I've been to workshops or t talks about that sort of thing before, but uh, I thought she did an excellent job of gathering information. There were quite a few that I hadn't heard of that she mentioned, and um, I don't remember any of them now because I, my brain is toast. But um, luckily, she in the syllabus she had a list with links that you could go to, and uh, so uh, a workshop like that is is always quite useful because there's bound to be some places that you didn't think to look, and she was quite good at ferreting them out, and even though she was an American speaker, she went to a great deal of trouble to find out of the Canadian information as well. So, that's good. Well, I managed to get about to about four or five lectures. Three or four of them were on DNA, so I will probably save most of those for the DNA SIG meeting. But there was one I went to where um, James Thompson and Elizabeth Keggy, who are both members of Toronto Branch, described in, in uh, detail how they helped uh, one gentleman, who was an adoptee, find his roots. And it was an extremely fascinating talk for me because his mother was Anglo-Indian. So they had to do a lot of research in India which was quite intriguing. And the father was supposedly a major, and I'll forget, I've forgotten the last name now, I'll just call him Smith, but it was better than Smith. Anyway, and he was supposed to be uh, a sharpshooter in a regiment in India. Well, when they were looking at the timelines, um, they also knew that he was an older gentleman with, with luxurious white hair and he walked with a cane and strutted around town like he owned the place. So these are all things that the adoptive mother had told this gentleman. Now this whole um, odyssey, Elizabeth Kagey was talking to this, this gentleman on one of the uh, mailing lists and he was ready to give up. And she basically said to him, please don't give up because I've just had breakthroughs on my family. She was an adoptee and I'll help you. Well, that was in about 2008. <laughs> so it's been an eight year odyssey for the family. Uh, and they've become quite good friends. At any rate, eventually they found that Major was really a showman. He was in a circus. He was a sharp shooter in a circus. <laughs> and they found wonderful, absolutely wonderful articles 
from around the world, Singapore newspapers. And, it, it, you know, it just kind of blows your mind where they found all this information about him. He, at one point, he was in a newspaper article and said he was, he had 25 living children. Okay, I can believe it. I think he also had several concurrent wives. <laughs> and he was a very colorful gentleman. But at any rate, they did finally resolve this. And they did, they also spent um, the last part of the lecture talking about how they found um, the Anglo-Indian mother and the information on her. And they, they didn't make their breakthroughs until they got him convinced him. It took them six years to convince the gentleman to do DNA. So you can see, even though it took them eight years, really two years after the DNA, they had it pretty well solved. So I was, I was quite thrilled with that lecture. It was very heartwarming. In fact, at the end, Elizabeth Kagi almost broke down, too, about how, how much this fella had, had been so thankful. At connect, and he connected with uh, one full-blood sister and one full-blood brother in the end. And he'd always felt kind of out of sync. And now he doesn't anymore. So that was really neat. Um, I did one on phasing. That's an advanced topic. I'm not there yet. And I did one on, uh, I did a workshop on the Friday on uh, autosomal DNA, what do I do now? And that was by Cece Moore. And she's the DNA genealogist who does the work on uh, Lewis, Henry Louis Gates Jr.'s uh, uh, television program and gives him the interpretation of all the DNA so that uh, he can, that she puts possibly and maybe and probably into the script but it always comes out she says it was very interesting to have some of the background of that too I can say something about Google okay but only if we can stay it is it okay I think we have it till Ten, don't we? Okay, well, I'll, I'll very quickly say something about Google and, and focus on the maps again. Uh, by the way, Google owns YouTube, and that's how we're streaming this presentation. But I just received a message in my email account from Google today saying that my photos had hit a new record or something. I had taken some uh, old photos that my grandfather had uh, from World War I. Uh, I better take these glasses off. <laughs> it looks kind of strange. Um, anyway, they said I had 5,000 hits, and that's only in a couple of months. Uh, he had been convalescing after the war in Southport in a church that had been converted to a hospital. And uh, so he had photos of this, and I was able to find that church again currently on street view, and then add the black and white photos, almost the same angle, with the staff standing in front of the church. And uh, people have been finding that, and of course there have been lots of hits. I was hoping that somebody might um, then give me information and you know, notice the photo, notice who posted it, because I probably, as I've told this story before, his nurse was Margaret Henderson, whose father was the doctor who was in charge of my grandfather's convalescence, and they became <clears throat> very close, but not close enough. He never did get to marry her. Uh, I also had a picture of the house because he did someone's convalescing at their lovely house in Southport and put that picture up and a bunch of other ones that he had. I would search around on, on Street View and then add it to the, the that color picture of Street View. I put his black and white in. Um, I haven't re really received any new information about Margaret Henderson other than she married a, a Mr. Smith and they had a son, Gerald, and they lived in, closer to Manchester. Maybe I'll find out more later. Um, There's quite a long story there, and of course we're late this evening, so I guess, Nancy, what's next for the meeting? You're going to uh, push a button here? Uh, I think that's pretty well going to be it. Okay. And then you can contribute uh, to Google. <laughs> you're going to have to show us how to put the pictures in, the way you're talking oh, about. Okay. That's very short interesting. Topic one day. Yes, yeah. please. <laughs> I think we'll take uh, a miss on the brick wall bomb. <laughs>